Okay, I, I don't know if people can hear me, but uh, this is Yukni Nulal at Columbia University. Uh, thanks for joining our webinar. This is one of a series that has been supported by Quasi on America's Water and is an adjunct to our National Science Foundation project on the same topic. Uh, we've had several people who have covered different aspects of water, bringing a national perspective to their research. And that thread continues today with Megan Konor from University of Illinois, who's, a, who's an assistant professor there and has been doing some very interesting work on virtual water and related topics. Uh, she's, her background is a PhD from Princeton and in environmental engineering and prior degrees in environmental science related areas and water science and management from Oxford as well. Uh, Today she has two small talks that she is kindly agreed to present. The first one is on virtual groundwater transfers from the stressed aquifers in the US. Uh, and the second one is um, one on crop insurance and its impacts on water withdrawals for irrigation. Both seem really interesting topics and instead of taking up more time, I would like to get Megan started on this. Uh, Megan, thanks very much for doing this and we look forward to a discussion at the end. Great. <clears throat> and thank you. Thank you to Mani for inviting me and thank you to Lisa for helping me to organize the technical aspects and, and working with me. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So I just wanted to take a, a moment briefly just to introduce myself. So I, um, as Manu mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at, at Urbana-Champaign um, in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. And my research interests focus mostly on the water-food nexus. Uh, predominantly, most of my work has also linked in um, trade aspects, so how the movement of food commodities links water and food systems. Um, but today I'm going to present a talk that's getting outside that realm where I'm looking at now the impact of crop insurance. Um, and so then I have three kind of broad categories of research I'm interested in. Um, I look at water footprints, mostly of food. Um, I do some network analysis. I think of trade and international movements of food as complex networks. And I'm also increasingly getting interested in causal inference, which is where I try to determine causality in complex systems. So two of my talks We'll touch on two of those topics today. Let me just see if I can work these slides. There we go. So the first one I wanted to talk about is a water footprint talk. And so this is titled Virtual Groundwater Transfers from Overexploited Aquifers in the United States. And this is a work led by my student Landon Marston in collaboration with Jimmy and Kai and Tara Troy. And this was published over the summer in PNES. So that's, that's available if anybody's interested and wants to read further. And I'll also, uh, Landon will also be presenting that at AGU next week. So here, um, the motivation is basically to understand, we know a lot about the production uses of groundwater. The motivation of this study is to now to understand where that groundwater is being consumed by the end consumer. So here on this slide, I'm presenting some global statistics on the sectors that use groundwater resources. About a third of domestic water use comes from groundwater. 42% uh, of agricultural water use comes from groundwater and 27% uh, of industrial water use comes from groundwater. So it's important across industries across sectors, and these values are global averages though. So in some spaces and in some times, groundwater will be even more critical to production in these sectors. And not only is it already important, but groundwater is projected to become increasingly important as the climate changes and surface water supplies become increasingly variable, uh, will increasingly value these more stable reserves of groundwater that we should start to think of as a, a bank of water, essentially, to help us mitigate these climate variable times. So we think that groundwater will become increasingly important in the future. So it's important to understand what, how it's being consumed currently. Yeah. 
And along these lines, we know that aquifer depletion is increasingly unsustainable around the world. Um, so here, this is a figure from a paper by Gleason et al. 20, sorry, that date is cut off. I believe it's 2012. Um, so actually, most aquifers in the world are not being overexploited. Those are all the ones delineated in blue. So there's a lot of aquifers in the world that are being used sustainably, which means that they <clears throat> are being withdrawn at a rate less than their recharge rate. However, there are a few places in the world, hot spots of groundwater use, where the water is being used much quicker than it's being replenished. Places like the Middle East, India, and then there's also some aquifers in Mexico and the United States that are being used much faster than they're being recharged through natural hydrologic processes. And so here I want to focus in on some of those aquifers in the U.S. And this is a time series of groundwater depletion over the last couple of decades. And the colorful lines indicate specific aquifers, and the black lines indicate the sum across all aquifers. And that black line is increasing pretty dramatically since about 1960. And over that couple of decade period, a lot of that is due to three aquifers in particular. The red aquifer, which is the High Plains aquifer, the blue, light blue color, which is the Gulf Coastal Plain. I'll also refer to that as the Mississippi Embayment Aquifer. And then the green line, which is the Central Valley Aquifer in California. So those three aquifers over the last couple of decades have been increasingly withdrawn, primarily for agricultural production. And so here I'm presenting a map of those three aquifers. And the Central Valley is in the Central Valley of California. The High Plains, you can see, stretches across the mountain region in the central part of the U.S. And the Mississippi Embayment is at the, the mouth of the Mississippi River. And in the last, since 2000, 93% of all, all aquifer depletion in the U.S. was due, was, was concentrated in just these three aquifer systems. So these are really where a lot of the groundwater use is occurring within the United States, and it's primarily for agricultural production. So we know that the United States is a very important player in the global food system. We're a huge producer of agricultural commodities, as well as being a, a major consumer. And we also exchange our food commodities with many countries in the world, so we're a large trade power. So some motivating questions for this work are basically what global demand forces, uh, intranational and global demand forces are driving these uh, depletion of these aquifers. And that's really to try to understand where the water embodied in commodities being consumed from these aquifers, where is it being consumed around the world? And then on the flip side, once you know where those products are being consumed, you can start to understand those consumers that are potentially most vulnerable to the eventual reduction in production in these aquifer regions. So we really wanted to figure out not just the local production withdrawal requirements, but basically all the commodities, agricultural commodities being produced here and trace them to their final endpoints where they're being consumed and figure out who those consumers are and what consumers are likely to be impacted if these aquifers can no longer produce food. Oh, <clears throat> sorry, having some keynote to PowerPoint conversion issues. Um, but I just wanted to highlight that this study, the methodology in the study is predominantly using high resolution empirical data to track the withdrawals, the crop production, the international transfers, and also international transfers. And this is building on some previous work in my group where we also looked at international food transfers and virtual water flows around the United States. And one of the novel additions of this work was to add in a high resolution harbor level international trade data. So now we trace food to specific ports of the United States, say the LA Harbor, and then we have trade data from the LA Harbor to specific countries such as China or Japan. And so here is a little schematic basically of the methodology we employ. So we use high res the highest resolution commodity uh, data that's available. Uh, much of the data is available at the county level in the United States. 
So the county level data we use is the USGS water use data, the USDA agricultural production data. Um, and then we also combine that with virtual water content data from McConan and Hoekstra. And so the main goal here is basically to calculate the virtual groundwater content of a food commodity. And so that's basically the volume of groundwater embodied in specific food commodities and then to track it through the food transfer flows to its final endpoint. So we start with this equation here for virtual water content, and that's the one from a, a commonly used database in the water footprint literature from McConan and Hoekstra. And the definition of virtual water content here is the total evapotranspiration of a crop during the growing season, plus the internal water divided by the crop weight. So the internal water is essentially negligible if you think of a tomato, it's if you were to squeeze a tomato, how much water would come out of that tomato compared to all the water used to grow the tomato during the time it was in the field, um, which is the total evapotranspiration. So the total evapotranspiration is by far the, the largest fraction of the water footprint of a tomato. And then you divide that by basically the yield of each agricultural item. So that's a, a, a commonly employed um, measure in the literature. But here we were interested in now just narrowing that down to the groundwater itself. So here that is the virtual groundwater content. And so to figure that out, we first figured out how much blue virtual water was used. So that's the total irrigation inputs to the agricultural item, surface and groundwater. And then we then further subsetted that to what we call the groundwater fraction. So of all the irrigation flow, all the irrigation inputs, what fraction is coming from groundwater compared to surface water? And then we basically are aggregating this. So the food transfer data we have is lumped in commodities. So it's lumped to a, a commodity class called cereals, for example, which includes smaller cereals such as wheat, corn, rice, etc. And then we uh, arrived at a production weighted virtual groundwater content. So we determine how much production of each small cereal group comprises that um, SCTG commodity item. And that's how we arrive at the virtual groundwater content of each SCTG commodity class. Now I have a table coming up which shows those seven commodity classes. And then the spatial unit you'll see here, I refer to that as a CFS. So we're using the Commodity Flow Survey internal trade database in the US. And that's broken down into about 120 CFS spatial units covering the US. So it's uh, smaller than a county. Uh, so there's, there's less of them than counties, but there's more of them than states. So it's somewhere between those two spatial scales. And then so that's our virtual groundwater content. And then finally, we want to trace it so where is this virtual groundwater going? So we trace that internally within the US using that commodity flow survey database. And then we also tra uh, trace it internationally using that harbor specific international trade data. And then here, this is one of the tables we arrive at. So here we've broken it down by those SCTG commodity classes. So there's seven food commodity classes provided by the CFS commodity um, flow survey. Um, things like animal and fish, cereal grains, other agricultural products, animal feed, meat, fish and seafood, milled grains, and then other foodstuffs. And so within that there's also a long list of the specific items that are within each commodity class. But generally you can then we, quant we quantify the virtual groundwater content for each commodity class and each aquifer. And you can see that there's a general trend of decreasing virtual groundwater content as you move from west to east. And this is what you'd expect because you have a higher climatic demand for evaporation in the west than you do in the east. So this follows that general trend. And it also follows the general trend where meat commodities have a higher water footprint, a higher virtual groundwater content than do non-meat commodities. However, you see that this is slightly more nuanced than a total water footprint, and that's because now we're just restricting it to total to, to groundwater. 
So, for example, in the Mississippi Embayment, many of their meat items are grown with rainwater or surface water irrigation rather than groundwater irrigation, which is why they actually have a lower virtual groundwater content than do some non-meat commodities. Okay, and so then once we've figured out the virtual groundwater content of the commodities, we can start to figure out where the withdrawals within each aquifer system go. So here the total withdrawals vary by aquifer. The most, more withdrawals occur in the high plains. About 23.38 cubic kilometers are withdrawn in the high plains. Um, and this is all for the year 2007. Uh, almost 14 are withdrawn in the Mississippi embayment and 9.34 in the Central Valley. So then our contribution is to really start to fraction this up and figure out where those withdrawals are going. And so there's four main uses of those withdrawals. They're first either just lost due to evaporative losses for irrigation. They're embodied in food commodities that are then transferred within the aquifer region itself. They're embodied within agricultural commodities that go elsewhere in the United States or they're embodied in agricultural items that are shipped abroad. And so one main question we had was what fraction of the aquifer water is going abroad? And so you can see, sorry, these blues are actually hard to distinguish, but um, that kind of one just to the right of the darkest blue is actually indicating the international flows. And so the largest fraction and the largest volume as well actually uh, is sent abroad from the Mississippi Embayment Aquifer. So for the Mississippi Embayment, about 1.43 cubic kilometers is sent abroad embodied in agricultural commodities, which comprises about 10% of all withdrawals from that aquifer system. And that's followed by 7.8% uh, from the Central Valley and 3.4% from the High Plains Aquifer. And then we were excited because we can actually spatially disaggregate where that water is being consumed within the United States itself. So now we have a, a spatially refined understanding of where these aquifer waters are being consumed. So here I'm presenting maps and the more red a state is, the more water it's consuming from each aquifer system. So for example, in A, California is very uh, dark maroon. So they're, the state that's, that's consuming the largest amount of water from the Central Valley, as you'd expect. But then other states, such as Texas, are also consuming a lot of water from that aquifer system through the food that they're consuming. And so you see that there's some, as you might expect from the general gravity model of trade, that transfers are predominantly occurring between aquifers, uh, large population centers, wealthy areas, and states that are close and distance to one another. So st states that are close to those aquifers are receiving a lot of food from those aquifers, as well as large population and wealth centers. And then we can also start to understand some of the cities that are consuming a lot of virtual groundwater from these aquifer systems. So here it's broken down by aquifer, uh, aquifer system as well and city. So for example, for the Central Valley, about 17% of the virtual groundwater exports of the Central Valley are going to the San Francisco and Oakland. And that represents a volume of 1.78 cubic kilometers. So this is noteworthy because the top two cities, San Francisco, Oakland, and Los Angeles, together comprise roughly as much water as is physically transferred via the LA aqueduct, which is 3.4 cubic kilometers. So we're talking about a, a fairly significant amount of embodied water. And then interestingly, uh, a, a pattern we, we see that you might expect is that transfers from the High Plains aquifer are more dispersed. So there's not really one main metropolitan hub that's dominating virtual groundwater transfers from this aquifer. And that's just due to the geography of the aquifer it's more centralized, there's not really many large urban areas there, and also the food commodities being grown are predominantly grains, which are easier to transport far and wide. Um, that differs from the Central Valley, where large cities in California are, are really drawing on those aquifers, 
as well as the Mississippi Embayment, where most of the water embodied in agriculture is going to the port of New Orleans and either being further refined into other food commodities or then being shipped abroad. And then here in this, this is a, a network plot. And the way you read this is essentially you look, so the three aquifers are listed on the outer ring. So the High Plains aquifer is shown in yellow. The Mississippi Embayment is shown in blue. And the Central Valley aquifer is shown in green. So then you can just follow the, the um, ribbons of each color and trace it to the final country that's consuming those virtual groundwater resources. So for example, one of the largest ribbons or links in this network is the Mississippi Embayment Aquifer is sending a large link to Mexico. So uh, a lot of water from the Mississippi Embayment is being consumed in Mexico. But you can see that, um, and then the importers are shown, so their outer ribbon is separated from the ribbons going to them with a small white band, if you can see that. So most of the importers are shown in red, and the, you can see that a lot of Asian countries are consuming water from these three aquifer systems, China, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, and the rest of Asia are shown as some major importers and consumers of food that relies on these aquifer waters. And then finally, this is the last set of results for this paper. Um, but here, so we're not actually looking at any virtual groundwater in this paper, or in this graph, uh, table, sorry. But what we're looking at is basically these countries are now ranked by column four, which is showing the uh, quantity of cereal that each country is, is uh, importing that's reliant on these aquifer systems. So this is an indicator of basically how reliant some countries might be for food security purposes on these aquifers. Um, so for example, the United States obtains 18.7% of its entire cereal supply from these three aquifers. So it's important to the US food security because cereal is a very important commodity for food security. And that's, um, and there was also some large fractions for some other international uh, countries. So Taiwan, Japan, Panama, they all obtain uh, 9 to 10 percent of their total cereal supply from these aquifers. So the cereal grown with groundwater in these aquifers represents a large fraction of some countries' domestic cereal supply, and it may have implications if these cereal items can no longer be grown in these aquifers. Um, and so these countries aren't necessarily vulnerable just due to the volume uh, or mass of food that they import because, because some countries will be more able to pay if these commodities increase in price. So, for example, imagine these aquifers were no longer able to produce cereal tomorrow. Um, cereal prices would go up globally. Japan might not be as impacted because they're likely more able to, to buy more expensive cereal but perhaps Panama might be more impacted if this were to, if this were to be the case. Okay, so just in conclusion, I wanna in, uh, indicate a few potential policy implications of these findings. So we've shown that these aquifers are important uh, both within the US and internationally. So within the US, they're important for domestic food security and they also provide a trade advantage. So if domestic policymakers want to um, begin to value these groundwater resources, they, they might want to start thinking about ways to price them or introduce property rights that can limit their overexploitation. Um, on the other hand, international consumers, they, should, uh, they might want to ev start evaluating if they're vulnerable to eventual reductions by uh, in production from these aquifers and if they decide that they are vulnerable then they can consider diversifying their food supply or they may even want to consider paying for these in, in situ groundwater services and here i just wanted to do a, a shameless plug for this work being presented at agu so if you uh, were interested and you'd like to chat some more with myself or Landon Marston about this work, and you'll be at AGU. It's being presented Monday morning 
um, in this session, uh, Monday morning, 9.15 to 9.30. So it'd be great to, to have you there and to have some further discussion. And with that, I think I can take a few minutes for questions about this paper before I move on to the next mini paper. So if anybody has any questions, I can take those now or I can, I can hold those off for the end. So if you have questions, please type them into the window on the right and then Megan can see them and answer. Looks like James is typing a question at the moment. Great. Okay, so it looks like James is curious about the virtual water contents that don't follow the west-east decreasing trend. Um, and so this is, so again, just keep in mind, this is not the total virtual water content. If it were, we would expect that to strictly follow that climatic gradient. But here, we're just restricting it to the groundwater content. So you have food that's being irrigated from the surface, irrigated from groundwater, and also receiving rainfall inputs. So it's possible that the total, uh, so the total should follow that gradient, but it's just the groundwater fraction that sometimes deviates from that gradient because you might have more surface irrigation, for example, occurring in the east. So their, their blue water content would be high, but their groundwater content might be relatively lower than in the west. So I hope that that answers your question. But it's just the fact that we're restricting it to only groundwater inputs. But yeah, that was a helpful question. Thanks. So does anybody else have any other questions? Or I don't see anybody else typing. So perhaps I will move on to the next talk. And we can, ans we can take questions for both talks at the end. Great. OK, so next I wanted to um, kind of switch gears and take advantage of this opportunity to present another theme of my research that's um, pretty relevant to the America's Water Project. So here I am interested in, in basically trying to decipher the impact of crop insurance on water use in agriculture. And so this is work in collaboration with uh, Tatiana Duryuzhna. She's in the finance department here at the University of Illinois, and she's an insurance expert and, and my student, Zhao Wenlin. So here the motivation is really that we know that agriculture is very susceptible to production risk, mostly due to weather variability and weather shocks. So things such as drought, flood, and climate-related disease and pest outbreaks are very important in, in reducing basically production and crop yields. So it's an important part of the agricultural system and has been pretty much since the beginning of agriculture itself. So interestingly though, these climate related risks have been increasing over time. And here this is a graph just showing all climate related risks. It's not restricted to just agriculture, but agricultural related risks um, follow a similar trend as well. So these risks have been increasing over time over the last couple of decades, and they're anticipated to continue to do so, which will have negative impacts for agricultural production and crop yields. And here I just wanted to remind some of you of the, the 2012 drought in the Midwest, uh, as well as the ongoing California drought. So these are some examples of, of current um, climate events that are leading to a lot of crop losses. So one tool that's come, across, come about in the social system to help farmers and agricultural producers mitigate some of this risk is crop insurance. And so here crop insurance doesn't help farmers reduce their production risk, but what it helps them to, pr to protect them from is their financial risk. So it's essentially saying that if you buy a policy, we will help shelter you from um, essentially going bankrupt if you are to lose all of your crop. And so this is a very large and mature system in the United States now. 
Um, in 2012, um, it's estimated that about $17 billion were paid through the crop insurance system to help farmers uh, cover their losses from that 2012 drought. So this is a very big um, financial system that's a, a big part of that farm bill. So here, federal crop insurance, what it does is it offers subsidized policies to farmers that helps to them to protect their finances, essentially. So if there is an adverse weather event, or if there is a plant uh, disease outbreak or insect infestation, they will still receive some financial compensation. And here I just wanted to reiterate how large and important the system is to, to agricultural production. So here are some statistics from 2014. So in 2014, there were estimated to be about 1.2 million crop insurance policies covering 120 different crops. And uh, I was impressed by the area. So crop insurance protects an area of 294 million acres. And that's larger than California and Texas combined. And the total insured value of all agriculture that's insured exceeds $110 billion. So this is a large, significant part of our farming system. But um, importantly, we really don't understand how this impacts other important aspects of the farming system, such as irrigation withdrawals for agriculture. So crop insurance is important. It's, it's here to stay. But we don't really <clears throat> understand what it's doing to water resources. So theoretically, if uh, in, in insurance literature, theoretically, when you take out insurance, you, that you are typically less motivated to take good care of the item that you're insuring. So this is known as moral hazard. So for example, think of when you take out car insurance. When you take out car insurance, you might drive a little bit less carefully than you would in the absence of car insurance. So similarly, if farmers are to take out crop insurance, they might not take as good of care of their crops as if they did not have, have crop insurance. So this behavior is known as moral hazard, where you're not incentivized to ensure the, the, best, um, the best care of the item you're insuring. So if this is the case, then we might expect that farmers would actually irrigate their crops less because they're a little bit less worried if their crops are to fail because they don't irrigate them perfectly then they understand that they'll be paid an insurance payout, and so, so they might irrigate less. So theoretically, this is what we might expect the impact of crop insurance to be on irrigation withdrawals. However, insurance companies are pretty smart, and they realize that this is the expected behavior. So to counteract this, in the contracts, they, they require that farmers irrigate a normal amount in order to ensure that they'll be paid if there is to be a, a, a climate event. So it's uh, anecdotally, I've heard many stories of farmers actually having to water a crop that's cl clearly already dead. And that's just because they want to ensure that their meter shows that they irrigated to the best of their ability and that they're able to receive that insurance payout. So it's not really clear what the actual impact of crop insurance on crop water use is. And so if we just look at the data, if we run a simple regression, we can maybe start to understand at least what the correlation is telling us is going on. So here we obtained all the data on crop insurance from, uh, this is from the USDA Risk Management Agency from 1985 to 2001. And then we also obtained all the irrigation withdrawals from the USGS at the county level, from, also from 1985 to 2001. And we want to see now just what does a simple ordinary least squares estimate tell us about the relationship of these two variables. And so when we run that OLS regression, we see that, um, so here the X variable, this is um, um, how uh, economists portray their regression tables. So the X variable is shown, X variable is the five year change in log acres insured. And the Y variable is shown in the table, uh, the title of the table. So the Y variable is the five-year change in log water withdrawals. So we're interested in how, um, as we insure more acreage, how that changes our water withdrawals. 
And we have a few different specifications with various types of growth controls across counties. And we see that doesn't really change our, our coefficient estimate much. So we see that as we increase the acres that we insure, we increase our water withdrawals. And since it's in log specification, this coefficient has a uh, percentage uh, interpretation. So for every percentage that we increase uh, our insured acreage, we increase our withdrawals by 0 .0, roughly 0.05% across all specifications. And those are statistically significant to the 1% level um, in all three regressions. Okay, but keep in mind that those regressions were, were just simple OLS regressions, so they're subject to all this, the common problems and simple correlations. Uh, we have confounding variables that might be leading us to not get an accurate understanding of the causal relationship. Uh, we, and, and it's highly likely that we have reverse causality, so that you might actually have farmers taking out more insurance if they anticipate that it's going to be a dry year and they're going to have to irrigate more. So what we really want is we want a causal understanding of the impact of crop insurance on irrigation. So in order to obtain that, uh, we employ um, some uh, tools from causal inference. And the particular tool here we use is called instrumental variables. And so the way that instrumental variables works is you try to basically find a channel uh, or an instrument that precisely measures that chain a relationship that's just going from the variable of interest to the outcome variable of interest and where you can eliminate the impact of all these other confounders. So in our case here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to really pin down this causal relationship, this chain going from insurance to water use. And you're trying to eliminate the, the confounding effect of climate and other unobservable variables. And so what we do here is we take advantage of a 1994 insurance policy change. So to establish causality, we need to isolate the variation in crop insurance that is not related to the unobservable determinants of water use. And so luckily, such variation exists in the form of policy changes in crop insurance over time. And so here we take advantage of that, and we use a 1990, 1994, there was a Federal Crop Insurance Reform Act which made catastrophic insurance coverage mandatory for all producers who participate in farm programs. And then this policy was only in effect for one year, for 1995. In 1996, it was eliminated. So that created a de facto natural experiment where you can really try to pin down the impact of crop insurance on crop water use. And so here, uh, instrumental variables approach is also sometimes referred to as a two-stage least squares approach. So here I'm showing the first stage. And so the first stage is where you pin down your, um, your policy variable of interest. So here we're looking at basically how you can use the acres that were insured in 1994 as your instrument. And so with the insurance policy change, you'd expect those counties that had small coverage to be more impacted and those counties that had high coverage to be less impacted. And so say, for example, there was a county that had no insurance in 1994, that, that, but then this policy came into to being, then all those agricultural lands would have to take up insurance. So you'd have a very large uptake, very large positive change in your um, insurance variable. And then compare that to a, a county that basically already was maxed out on its insurance. It's pretty much all agricultural lands are insured. Then this policy comes into being. You are basically going to see no change in your um, insurance variable. So as you'd expect, if your x-axis shows insurance coverage in 1994, and it's going from small coverage to high coverage, you'd expect then your change on the y-axis to have a negative coefficient because that's a decreasing relationship. And so that's what we're showing here. So our first stage works out as we would expect uh, before we ran the, the regression. So for various specifications, we see that there is a statistically significant, at the 1% level, um, negative relationship between acres insured in 94 and the change to, to 95. So this is just showing us that our instrument works as we'd expect and that it's, it's plausible that it's a good instrument 
to now further understand the impact on water use. And so then we run our second stage, which is where you then use those changes in insurance uptake at the county level to see how that's driving changes in your water withdrawals. So that's our second stage coefficients shown in the second row here. So now we're looking at our X variable, this five year change in log acres insured, and our outcome variable for the last three columns is the change in log withdrawals. And so here, they're all statistically significant at the 1% level, and they're all uh, positive, indicating, and the coefficient here indicates that a 1% increase in insured acreage leads to a 0.2, roughly, a percent increase in the log water withdrawals. And so on this uh, note that these estimates are all much higher than the estimate we obtained from a simple least squares, which was 0.05. And so, and, and more importantly, this coefficient has a causal interpretation. So now we can say that we're more accurately pinning down that causal impact of insurance on irrigation withdrawals. So <clears throat> we wanted to dig in a little bit further though and say, well, why, why would increasing your insurance increase your water withdrawals in agriculture? So first, we, we dug in a little further just to see what type of water was being more impacted. And we find that it's actually groundwater that's driving most of these results. <clears throat> Excuse me. So for every percentage increase in insured acreage, you have a 0.275 increase in log groundwater withdrawals compared to a 0.148 increase in log surface withdrawals. And groundwater is also more statistically significant. So for every acre you insure, you're, comp you're in irrigating more in terms of your groundwater irrigation. And so if you look at the, the average acres and how they're changing, as well as the data on withdrawals, we find that that point estimate corresponds to where a 1% increase in insurance leads to a 0.17 cubic kilometer increase in surface water and a 0.19 cubic kilometer in groundwater withdrawals. And so these are actually um, very significant values when you extrapolate them from a point estimate to the entire policy change estimate. And so when you extrapolate those to see what the impact of the entire 1994 Federal Crop Insurance Reform Act had on irrigation withdrawals, you found, you found that it actually increased surface withdrawals by 20.9 cubic kilometers and groundwater withdrawals by 23.4 cubic kilometers. So this is, this is likely a, a high or a, a, an upper bound estimate on the impact of the policy because we're taking a more precise point estimate and extrapolating it across the entire policy. But it at least gives you some idea of the magnitude of the insurance policy on withdrawals. And so, so why might farmers irrigate more as they increase their insurance? And so one potential mechanism is that farmers are changing their crop mix planting decisions based on having insurance. So we wanted to see how the number of acres of each crop were changing as insurance changes. So this is similar, this is a second stage regression, but now our outcome variable of interest is the harvested area of these five key crops. So you can see that um, it's statistically significant for most crops, except for rice, um, decreasing for corn, rice, and soy, and farmers are growing more cotton and wheat, though. So there's, a, a not, there's also a much larger impact for cotton than there is for wheat. So this leads us to think that perhaps farmers are changing their planting decisions to grow cotton, and perhaps they're growing more groundwater-fed cotton as a result of having crop insurance. So to test that, we uh, just did some simple correlations between groundwater changes and cotton acreage changes. Um, that's what's shown in A and B. Um, but from the regression, you can see that more cotton acreage is correlated with more groundwater withdrawals. And so we looked across all crops and see that there is no other crop that shows a statistically significant positive relationship between having more area planted in that crop 
and having more groundwater withdrawals occurring in that county other than cotton. So we um, at least are able to identify farmers switching to groundwater fed cotton as one channel via which crop insurance increases irrigation withdrawals. And so this, um, to conclude from this work, we find that the impact of crop insurance on irrigation withdrawals is, is significant in its, in its statistical significance and in its magnitude. The magnitudes are, are relatively large, about 20 uh, for surface and 23 for groundwater cubic kilometers being withdrawn extra as a result of this insurance policy. Um, and that's um, in relation to one statistic I found which highlights that all of the um, uh, installation of efficient irrigation systems in the Western U United States in the 90s led to about two cubic kilometers of water being saved. So this is definitely a significant volume. And we're able to identify crop switching as one important channel through which crop insurance impacts withdrawals. So interestingly, um, one unintended consequence of the entire crop insurance system has been to contribute to the overexploitation of groundwater reserves, which is something that uh, we hadn't understood until, un until to date and was not intended by this crop insurance policy. And so one um, thing to always note when doing instrumental variables or, or causal inference is that it has a lot of precision you're able to make a causal statement within the bounds uh, has, of, the, of the system that you're looking at. But external validity is always a concern. And so we're looking at a policy from 1994 to 1995, and we're looking at the United States. So the natural question is always, does, are we able to extrapolate this finding outside the United States? And are we able to extrapolate this finding within the United States to other times? So that's, that's a, a current outstanding question, but we think since the fundamental design of crop insurance has not changed significantly since this, this policy was enacted, that our results should at least be, be fairly relevant today and in other countries that follow this insurance design. And again, I'd like to put in one more shameless plug for this talk at AGU. If you're at AGU, I would love to to discuss this further with you, I'll be presenting this Wednesday afternoon in the Water Resources Management and Policy in a Changing World uh, Part 1 session. So if you're at AGU, uh, I'd love to chat with you some more. Okay, but thank you very much, and I, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, so it looks like Steve Burgess has a question. So all R squared values are small, which is true. And so in causal inference, um, it's typically not the R squared value that's of primary concern, because here we're looking at changes first. We're also looking at, um, we keep having growth controls in our regressions, and we're also um, employing a two-stage least squares approach. So that basically, most people who use these tools indicate that the R squared is not as important of a, of a concern as it might be in a simple OLS regression. So it's more the coefficient, and it, whether or not it's statistically significant, that's, that's the primary outcome that you're interested in. And yes, commodity prices are low. Um, I ha that's a good question. I'd have to think about how that might impact the situation. Um, but yeah, I'll have to think about that some more. But at a first thought, the I mean, the main methodology is really just pinning down the impact of crop insurance on water use. And so that's not, it, it's a lot of these other variables you can say are, are external to the, to that understanding. So, so it's possible that it, it wouldn't impact it too significantly, but I'd have to, I'll have to think about that some more. 
Okay, Mora. So why would crop insurance impact cotton and corn differently? So you look at subsidies. So it's not necessarily that the crop insurance is impacting cotton and corn differently, but it's just that the incentives for farmers in terms of the financial outcomes are now different. So a lot of people have looked at crop insurance. Um, for example, there was a great paper um, that was a, so the, the whole, so the gold standard basically is to be able to run a random controlled trial where you were, if, where we could randomly distribute insurance to farmers uh, and then randomly just not distribute it to other farmers and see how they change their behavior. Um, so this, the next best thing is basically doing what we did, which is to do a causal inference statistical approach. But some people were able to do a, a random controlled trial in Africa with crop insurance, and they find that it actually does lead to farmers changing their behavior and growing more risky crops than they otherwise would without crop insurance. So it's not necessarily that crop insurance is impacting crops differently, but it's just that it's giving farmers different incentives to grow uh, riskier crops potentially. Uh, so you might be seeing more cotton being grown in marginal lands that requires groundwater irrigation. So that might be a more kind of risky behavior that these farmers wouldn't undertake in the absence of, of crop insurance. Okay, and then James Rising. Farmers will normally insure only part of their lands, so the 94 intervention probably introduced different land. Do you have a reason to believe your results are relevant to insurance on the non-94 land? So, so that's sort of what I was getting at with the interpretation or whether these results are externally valid or not. So we, we definitely trust our estimates for this time period, for the, the 1995 time period. But yes, it did lead to different lands being grown under different crop types. Um, so we, we think that there's at least some external validity to our results since, since the fundamental design of crop insurance hasn't changed in the United States but that is, is definitely something that needs to be carefully considered. Okay, a long, a long question from, from Manu. Have you looked at the economics of the matter? Specifically, crop insurance is a cost and this delivers a stabilization of income. Similarly, applying irrigation translates into a stabilization of income, both translate into decisions on crop choice. You may want to think about how crop prices have fluctuated and hence whether the crop choice shift is directed by market forces and the stabilization strategies follow. Is the causality the reverse of what you decided using your specific IV? Um, so yeah, this is definitely a good question that I'll probably have to digest and ponder upon some more. Um, and it's true, so irrigation can be thought of as a complement to insurance, and that's because it does also help farmers stabilize um, their risk. Um, so we like to think that the causality would not be the reverse of what, what we found with our IV, but we, we think we're properly identifying the causality chain going from insurance to the outcome variable water use but but we definitely you know i'll have to think about this some more that's that's a, you know a, a good a good question Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate the opportunity to discuss it further.
Okay, great. Well, thank you to everybody. I hope it was interesting. And for those of you um, who are interested in discussing further, I'd be happy to do that offline. Or if you're going to be at AGU next week, happy to, to meet up and chat further. Um, but yeah, I don't really have anything else to add. Okay, thanks very much, Meg. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at AGU. And uh, then we can talk more there. Okay, wonderful. All right, safe travels, everybody. Likewise.